It is with great pleasure and honor that I introduce Reggie Gibson, our feature today. I'd like to start out by saying the quote that we have listed in our, our press currently for Reggie. This is from Kurt Vonnegart. When you perform, you are supersonic and in the stratosphere, where you can see that the earth really is a ball, moist, blue-green. Reggie, you sing and chant for all of us. Nobody gets left out. And I love that, and I'd like to tell you a little bit why before Reggie comes up here. Reggie grew up in Chicago and spent his summers in Mississippi and said that he spent a lot of time reading as a child and also playing solitary chess, and he said, I always won. <laughs> he wrote his first poem at age six or seven and said that he has been much inspired by his great-grandfather, who taught him railroad songs of the past and also songs of the blues. Reggie did a lot of traveling after school, um, and at 24, he had been across the United States and Europe. And he said that he felt especially that he learned a great deal about poetry and performance from the slam poets of the slam poetry scene, like Patricia Smith. Since then, he's been identified as a poet, a songwriter, an author, a workshop facilitator, an educator at schools and universities and theaters on two continents in seven countries, and most recently, Cuba. Reggie and his work appear in a new line cinema film, Love Jones, a film based largely on events in his life. He has worked with people including Gwendolyn Brooks, Kurt Vonnegut, the monks of Drepong, Gamong, John Legend, Most Deaf, Mark Strand, Savian Glover, and more. He has also worked with a vast number of artists of poetry and music, including world, Celtic, jazz, blues, and salsa, and European. And it is of importance that Reggie so naturally and beautifully fuses music and poetry together as well, something that we celebrate here each month. His works of poetry have been paired with flute music. He founded a literary musical ensemble, Synesthesia, combining literary and music arts of different musical genre, genres, and in 1999 performed for the Steppenwolf Theater award-winning traffic series, performing portions of Kurt Vonnegut's Fates Worse Than Death. He's a National Poetry Slam champion, and he has been the co-judge for competitions with Mark Smith and Mark Strand and featured on NPR and HBO Deaf Poetry Jam, widely published in a number of poetry sources, and he has a full-length book, book, Storms Beneath the Skin. In 2005, he was featured on the PBS Arts Magazine close-up and subsequently nominated for a Grammy. And most recently, he competed in one in the Big Boat International Competition held in Italy. Reggie has received his MFA in poetry from New England College and continues to perform and lecture and give workshops across the United States. And he performs with his new literary music ensemble, Neo Juju. When asked for one of his best moments sharing poetry, Reggie said he was doing a poetry reading at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Chicago. And when he was performing his poetry and the music in the music form, that he closed his eyes during the poem and lost orientation where he was and wound up seeing himself on the other side of the room and confessed that it freaked him out. But he said, I felt like I found a portal through poetry and music. I've had close moments before, but that was a breakthrough. And then he connected this with a reading he had done once in Detroit during a blizzard where only eight people showed up trudging through the snow there, and he said that he loved that show. 
Reggie said, I didn't have to be showmanshipping or a superstar. I was able to read more personal poems and have intimate gathering and to look in people's eyes, and I was thankful for this. It was a beautiful experience. Reggie connected the two, that although they seem polar, that one took me out of myself and the other took me deep within myself. And we look forward to seeing where Reggie will take us this morning. And I would now like to introduce you to Reggie Gibson. Please help me welcome him up here. Reggie Gibson. Hey, guys. How's everyone? Good. Um, thank you for showing up. <laughs> First off, for waking up. And whatever, you know, was the finger that touched your eyelids this morning, be thankful for that. I also appreciate anyone who, you know, gets up early on a Saturday morning to come out and hear this, <laughs> right? I like to call us this tribe of word nerds, you know, people, people who, after everything that we've gone through, we still believe that words have the power to change and alter reality, right? Have the power to mean something, um, even in a time when we're increasingly becoming tools of service unto some form of consumerism. But really, I thank you all for being here. And um, yeah, let's see where we go together. Oh, Miss Melody, thank you for the song. Where is she? Is she still here? Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. I think sometimes we lose, we lose track of, right, the life that we're living and that it's a blessing to have it. An ochre song called you from the corners of post-existence. You appeared, a silent apparition of language, and I became pregnant with the word. And the word took flight on crimson oceans of light, oceans of light screaming prayer into vermilion angles of wrangled space. Angled space sank like an obsidian siren into the mad mouth of my pocket. My pocket dangled a jangling death from the tongue of a stone victrola. A stone victrola coughed a murder of crows, shrieking translucent blue music. Blue music circled the bells of my waiting and insistent speech. My speech oracled itself toward the sword of your memory. Your memory casteth the shadows of my castrated breath. My breath, crying the kiss of an okra song, called you from the corners of post-existence. You appeared, a silent apparition of language, and I, 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 I became pregnant with the word. And the word was born. The word was born still. The word was still born in the center of turbulent awakening. The word became sunlight, carving her arpeggio into the archipelago of flat, unfolding blackness. The word became. The word became the shards of dead stars that bled the egg of plant and planet. The word became. The word became the misspelled literature of trees caught in the abysmal womb of the eye. I, 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 I. The word became. The word became the silent hymn still singing in this ancient azure stone. And I saw the word, saw the word, knocked up, knocked up, snorting her death in syllables, drinking her liver in the dilapidated taverns of cities without nuance or name. The word there, her fingers bleeding blood red and raw from clawing the insides of 40-ounce coffins, severed the leg of the X, manifest itself as man riddled 41 times by the mystery of lead, left to die, eyes open, watching while life bled from a hole in the head back to the eye. I saw the word, I saw the word as the lying howl, the hungry vow, the dying child dragged to death, decapitated and sodomized by wood. I saw the word. I saw the word as a man beaten mercilessly because he loved the loins of other men. I saw the word. I saw the word as a brown boy's body resurrected after three days from the river bottoms of a nation's bloodied conscience. I saw the word. I saw the word will manifest herself again as female, her thighs slickened by patriarchy. I saw the word. I saw the word was entered, uh, was entered, uh, was entered by her father so many times she learned to believe his sickness was sacred. And I love the word. Dance with the word. Seven insistent saucers till 6 a.m. with the word, and the word was no longer afraid or ashamed to throw her head back and her arms skyward, and in white flashes of teeth and sweat drenched hair, mouth an incomprehensible mumbling to the rumblings of unstruck sound, the word sucked my tongue as I wrote this, the word spit 
hibiscus balm into my mouth. The word and I love that night, love that night. The word and I came into, unto, cried and died inside the word that night. And the word became, became, became pregnant with the word, grew inside, grew inside, grew inside the word. The word gave birth, uh, the word gave birth, uh, the word gave birth. Yeah. The word gave birth to the word, and the word became a brown child's fingers wiping tears away from her father's eyes. The word became, the word became a brown child's kisses blooming in spite of the hurricane. The word became, the word became a brown child's spirit reaching out to embrace the brown thin wrinkled hands of brown thin wrinkled arms of brown thin wrinkled women stirring pots of 5 a.m. grits in a cornerstone called Mississippi. The word lives inside of the universal thin spaces between N and exhalation, travels herself around the azure stone, traverses herself inside this azure stone, trapped and encased in condominiums of skin, forgetting and refusing to remember that she is I am. Thank you. Poetry is my form of prayer. Um, love like a nightmare, dance like a trumpet, pray like a hand clap, stumble like a bullet, write like a mantis, scream like a warm thigh, hang like a windstorm and grind like a sunrise, wink like a mute book, drink like a shaman, stream like a light wave, fly like an ocean, hug like a particle, eat like a porn flick, stutter like a mamadrical and kiss like a train wreck, Sweat like pentameter, flirt like an I am, screw like a trochee and cry like a samurai drum, like a sand dune, bathe like a sonnet, scratch like a snowflake and shake like a magnet stone, sit like a stampede, fight like an empty box, paint like an ant hill, rush like a stopped watch, laugh like a new shoe, smile like a jackknife, sing like a red moon, live like a loved life, poet like a split lip, whisper like a dance floor, hickey like a simile, be like a metaphor. To him, love was a nightmare. Danced through trumpets of one praying hand, clapping. The stumbling of bullets riding mantis-like screams on warm thighs, that's all he really wanted. He would hang out in windstorms, trying to night grind against any sunrise that rolls his way. On days and nights like this when you could catch him, microbating publicly at a poetry reading. Yes, he was a narcissistic one-use camera, loaded with testosterone film, winking aperture-like at any mute book in a miniskirt while talking overly developed crap about drinking shamans and coughing light waves into cosmic oceans. Not known for his intimacy, he would hug no particles too closely, being afraid they'd become attached and get all quirky on him. No. Instead, he'd consume bowl after bowl of porn flick and start a magicals into any woman's ear dumb enough to listen. Then one woman, let's just call her she, kissed that toad on his lying tongue in that newfound train wreck sort of way, and his pentameter began sweating like a libertarian caught screwing a liberal. <laughs> they laughed. They knew that this would not be a forever kind of thing because they knew that this would not be it. I mean, is it ever? No, she will leave him, but not before teaching his rain clouds to wrap the Torah, his howling maple leaves to swim like Buddhas and drum sand dunes into cathedrals. But for now, for now, they are bathing snowflakes, scratching mourning from their smiles as they fight to empty his boxes. Content to paint ant hills together, they rush like stopped watches through the laughter of this new shoe, their smiles widening like jackknives, gleaming like harvest moons, living and loving life from their mouths. They are why poets split their lips with speaking. They are why vacant dance floors gossip about insteps. They are the hickey of similes opening the faces of their closed ghosts and the elixir of metaphors becoming, becoming. Um, how I came to Massachusetts, I'm originally from Chicago. Um, I don't know how long you need to be in a place before you're no longer from somewhere else, you know. I'm not, I'm not sure what the rules are on that one, but um, 
as of right now, I'm still from Chicago. And um, I came here several years ago to do something called um, the Cambridge Poetry Awards. And um, I met the woman who would become my next and hopefully final wife. And um, this is, I guess, a poem about that experience and about the things that keep me here. Creation myth. That March day in Massachusetts when the second-rate poet went shopping, he never thought he would buy that black shirt, you know, the one embroidered with that crazy Eastern motif, the one he knew was not his style, the one he knew he would only wear once, the one he did, in fact, only wear once, yes, the one that hangs in the closet next to something else hanging in the closet. His main thought was, hey, wonder how this is going to look on stage this evening. He was vain that way. Likewise, when she, the feminist, wore that cleavage-clinging pink halter top and ultra-tight pair of black pants, you know, the outfit that screams, I want men to respect me for my mind? <laughs> yes, that one. The one that pilfers his speech even now. She was only dressing for a comfortable night out with a girlfriend, a girlfriend who flaked on her at the last moment, leaving her to go out alone. She was not used to going anywhere alone. She had never been to a poetry reading before. She almost didn't go, but then she did. She surprises that way. They did not expect to meet, much less fall into one another and walk that razor-thin, spiderweb-thin line that is sometimes being built between two people who had um, found each other interesting. He was a man who had a rather profound liking for the ladies, all of them. And she, while not being known to start conversations with second-rate poets, was a little more forward than usual. So somehow, though this is apocryphal, as stories tend not to corroborate, they wound up at IHOP. <laughs> and over a cup of coffee and a rooty tooty fresh and fruity, he thought, hmm, maybe, and she thought, uh, maybe. As for you, well, you were not yet you. That is to say, you were you. Potentially, but you were not yet this ever parasitic tsunami of new discovery fueled by laughter and lactation, leaving broken drinking glasses and ruined CDs in your wake. No, but you were somewhere, not quite there, a small curved line, faint and forming at the end of some egg named future. Then they loved, and it was good. So they loved again, and again. And during the August of one of those agains, the part of you that had been singing silently inside of him began to sing so softly to the part of you singing silently inside of her, and you began to grow into an island of song resembling you. And when the growing and the singing were done, you were lifted from inside the soft dark of her, lifted into light, into scream, into breath. After that, he took you into an empty room, and while no one could see the two of you, he held you above his head, looked upwards at the ceiling, imagined the fluorescent lights, a sea of stars, stretched endlessly above a land that smelled of salt water and village song. And as must have happened in the lands your ancestors came from, he held you close and trembling to his chest, told you what your name would be, thanked his now dead father for your safe passage, then asked for strength and guidance from whatever hand authored this. Thank you. Um, my wife always cringes at, a, at that point, right, um, when I talk about what she was wearing. Um, <laughs> She's like, I guess I wasn't being a very good feminist that night. You know, I'm like, well, you know, thank God. You know, <laughs> thank God for it. You know. Um, recently, I, I returned from uh, from Germany, seeing I have a daughter who's who's there in Germany, and um, I don't know about other men, but I'm one of those guys who who is is physically very difficult for me to be away from from my children. You know, um, 
I don't know if that's patriarchy or what. I don't know what that is, but it's a hard thing for me to do. And it's one of those things I always uh, think about. Uh, every man has a limp in his walk, and usually it's a child or a woman. Right? Um, recently, after being there, uh, I had sent her um, a poem some time ago, and these things start to take on different meaning every time I go back there. I was teaching a group of women poetry, if you can in, teach, in fact teach anyone poetry, but um, they helped me to reach a certain, a certain space to be able to talk about it. These are women who had been beaten, battered, abused by men, and, um, and they're, let's, let's just say when I came in to teach them, they were incredulous at best. You know, the last thing they needed was another man with some pretty words, right? So in talking to them for the two years that I was with them, as I said, they helped me get to a certain space, and I was finally able to write a poem. This is um, called In the Year I Loved Your Mother. It's for my daughter, Safia, who needed to know that it wasn't always painful. In the year I loved your mother, I lived a glorious death. I was a satellite traveling between blood and star, a planet evolving through rage and grief. In the year I loved your mother was a time of drought and deluge, a season of rain and ruin. Between us was much soil and water, an illiterate ocean of language and diction. I arrived to your mother half broken, half breaking. In the year I loved your mother, we were drum and drone, a volley of polemic and ideal. Once I glimpsed you, you were waving at me from her mouth, and as dawn met our shoulders, she whispered your name to me, and we became the thin line between sea and mountain, between valley and sky. In the year I loved your mother, gravity abandoned me to her. She was vortex, a black hole sewn into the belly of a continent. Grape was twine, was sound, was song, was motion, was dance, was dove, was vulture, was circling, was landing, was crushed all into singularity. All that was, was her. The year I loved your mother, was the year tragedy tamed our tongues? We severed ours, stitched them into one another's mouths. This is how we grew fluent in speaking pain. We brought stones from our pockets that year, traded them, hurled them back towards each other's wounds, and those that missed were gathered later, one by one, and used to build our walls. Safia, your mother was an equinox of razors when I found her. She was an autumn of featherless wings caught in this traveling gale of a man. Your mother was soft lips cutting calluses from my knuckles. She was a silk fist lodged hard in my mouth where she opened into a sunflower widening this crag of my throat. And in your mother's skin, I was cryptic blasphemy, transparent, decoded, and holy. Thank you. Um, one more child poem. Um, anybody here the mother, father, parent of teenagers? Or you've, got, you've made it through that? Okay, we have a few here who's still going through that hell. Hey, who, who made it on the other side? Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. My daughter, my oldest child, Jamila, she just turned 16. And, uh, you know, six years ago, I made the sun rise and set. You know, now I'm just that thing in her way. Um, give me some money and step, you know, just get away from me. And um, it's like, man, when did this happen, you know? Um, but I've, I've come face to face with the fact that, you know, or with the belief that um, when it comes to the moment of her deciding to take a lover, um, that it will be someone she loves and loves her. Because we can pretty much forget about that wait till your marriage day thing. Um, I mean, her mom and I certainly did. So this was me confronting a fear about that. But hopefully it would help her. What I wish for her. Prima nocta. A blessing for new lovers. May your first night open slow as a Yahwist prayer. 
May there be wind, a stirring of aureole and ear. May earth break beneath your nakedness like Eucharist in a priest's celibate hands. May the caved colors of Lascaux pigment your backs into the arc of bison. May you name your loving estuary, scent of mushroom, thunder lily, opened lung. May you lie there in eclipse and grammatical stun as both ecli ellipsis and closed quote finding a music sirened, oceanic, and waiting. Once you have ritualed in this anatomical swell and sweat, this liturgical call and cool, you may augur in the bird of your beloved's kiss, each past beloved. You may divine the tongue's etymology, learn which word wets the corners of the lush literate mouth. And your hands. Your hands may no longer be your hands, but other hands, the ghost of other hands, hands that once held the same face you hold even now, as you do even now, like this, like a poem fleshed between your fingers, the thumbs like your thumbs, twin circles of slow, brushing the same surrender from cheek and acquiescent eye. When these moments jealous within you, when they become Sisyphean stone tensed against your love's impossible movement, remain there as forest and willing wander in other. Even though you scratch yourselves along the trees, stumble through seas of thicket, though new branches break you into leaning away. Um. Yeah, that's a tough one. For me to write. Uh, George Bush is out of office, right? <laughs> um, so I never thought I would ever read this poem again. But th put this under the, the category of milking a poem for all it's worth, even when it's worthless. So um, this was something. I, I'm not very political in most of the things I do. But those last eight years just brought me to a point of outrage, you know? Um, so this is probably the last time I do this poem since he's gone. Um, we'll see how it works after he's out of office. In an unprecedented move, the shrub decides to write his own fate of the union address. Emergency texts at the ready as Freudian slips are expected. Ladies and gentlemen, the prayers. You know, there's a lot of people out here who don't understand the Constitution. See, the Constitution is very, very important. It uh, helps you digest your meats and your veggies. Mine's doing great. Oh, oh j just a moment. Oh, wrong Constitution. Well, see, that one's got to get stopped. Absolutely, before it messes around and inadvertently frees somebody. So from now on, I want all y'all when you hear this, it would please me right down to my Iraqi skin boots if when you hear this, you'd hear it thusly. P the people of the United States send order to bomb a more perfect onion. It's established. Men sure do mess with tranquility. Bromide for the calm on the fence. Provoke the venerable hellfare and uh, censure the blessings of liberty. Whore yourselves and your posteriors. See, uh, do more dames and uh, stab this constitution in Tucson for the United States of America. For we go this ruse to be stealth relevant. Fat, bald men procreate sequely. They are enwild by certain master debaters with hurt and unenviable slights. And amongst these are strife, liability, and a repute of craftiness. You know, Ever since 9-11, 9-11, that date which will live in infomercials. I have been reluctant to fly. You see, uh, I don't much cotton to the idea of being suspended up there between continents. I prefer to be right here in America, where I am uh, safely incontinent. See, uh, when I do have the occasion to fly all around God's wonderfully flat earth, 
I tend to run across people who are uh, living without the blessings of a Jesus-given democracy, and it just gets me all patriotic, and I want to pull my Patrick Henry on them and give them liberty. Or death. <laughs> but uh, since I'm a compassionate conservative, I don't see why I got to choose. I think I can give them both. <laughs> liberty and death. See, uh, that's the American way. Why have one thing when you can have two, you see? But see, that's going to take hard hard work, know-how, engine, uh, engine, uh, you see, it's going to take smarts, lots and lots of smarts, and that's the one thing we is in this country, isn't we? We am smarts, and I am the president of a smarts people, you know, and that's uh, also going to take uh, a plan, yeah, can't be forgetting them plans again, and vision. And just like that famous uh, black uh, Africa, uh, damn it, Condi, what are y'all this week? Oh, thank, thank you, baby. <laughs> like that famous Negro American, Dr. Martin Luther Sheen Jr. said, that now famous, I have a scheme speech of his. Well, I too have a scheme. It's a scheme deeply looted in the American scheme. It's a scheme that one day, all of them sandy folks over there, the uh, Sonny and the Shiitake, the, uh, the uh, uh, backups and the doo-wops, the, uh, the Gryffindor and the Slytherin. See, they're going to all come together at the table of otherhood and realize that there ain't nothing left to fear except fear myself. <laughs> no, uh, just the other night, I was uh, reading, reading, that's what you call that. I was reading the uh, Ten Commandments. And you know, uh, I always get weepy in the middle of that film. <laughs> Especially that part when uh, Chuck Heston, God rest his soul, smites them Egyptolites with the wrath of God <laughs> and all that fire and brimstone and <sighs> chariots. Uh, uh, huh. What was I bringing that up for? Can't quite recollect. Guess I gotta quit snorting pretzels and eating coke. Ooh. Probably shouldn't have said that. Americans don't like to think of their presidents as pretzel men. Should have said chips. Chips is more manly. That's all right, Fox News will clear it up for me. Anyway, let me, let me get out of here. I gotta go take my meds. So in collusion, I'd like to leave y'all with uh, those dying words of that famous, iconic Republican president, John F. Kennedy, who said, Ich bin ein Steinbrenner, which, as you may know, is 17th century Swahili, for ask not what your country can do for you when you just standing there with your bird in your hand, but rather ask who you can do for your country when there are at least Two in the bush. Good night. God bless you. And God bless these United States of America. <laughs> Sorry. The afterbirth of tragedy, since I'm in a mean mood. After a conversation with my ex-wife. Dear you, and you know what you are, being with you was the vestal opening of new books whose unread tongues licked paper cuts on my eyes. Being with you was incensed night, wafting days in anger and smoke. You, a phenomenology of geists, graceful as Hegel, Kant, dance. Being with you was like being a one-winged jackass, carpet munching the crab grass from between Kali's legs. It was like watching Pandora forever unlocking a box of Promethean livers. You make me wish erectile dysfunction was retroactive. <laughs> Let me be clear. I really hate being ununderstood. How can I say this? Being with you was both religious and philosophic, was like being an evangelical, polytheistic atheist. 
I just always had a sinking faith that more than one God was dead. Shum do de 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 shum do de 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 shum do de shum do de shum de shum do de shum de we de shum do de I'm sweet I'm de shum do de shum do de that open way head head on head seven way yeah um de shum do de um de shum do de shum do that open way shum do I Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and far more temperate. Rough winds do come and shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all. Too short a date. Wait, I'm wait, I'm say. Shem do we? Boom, we out and do that a good way. Shed a nest at a shooting way. Sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines. And often his gold complexion dims, and every fair from fair sometimes, sometimes declines by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade. Nor shall you lose possession of that beauty which thou owest. Nor shall death brag your wondrous in its shade. When in eternal times through these lines you grow, you grow, you grow. For as long as men can breathe, as long as eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. As long as men can breathe, as long as eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life, gives life to the day. Shum dwe, sum dwe, da do, dwe, da do, dwe, shum dwe, dwe. Um, I didn't write that one, <laughs> uh, so, but it was one of those ones I remember that early as a child. I don't know how much time I have, because I hate to go over time, so I know it's, uh, Cheryl, could you let me know? I know I have a Q&A as well, and I'd love to do that. Uh, Ten more minutes. I can do that. You guys okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you got up as well. Um, well... Let me see, since I went off, off the chart, off the script here. Let me see, um, what is my inside telling me to read right now? Oh, we have 10 more minutes. Um, I have, uh, a, well, I'll read this and then I'll read one more. I, read, I was in Monfalcone, Italy, uh, which is a postage stamp size town with some of the most wonderful people you know, you ever want to want to run into. It was a place Joyce used to hang on at. He used to go to Trieste all the time, and he would hop over to Monfalcone. I was invited there to be part of um, what they call their absolute poetry, big boat poetry competition. So they brought along all these poets from all around the world uh, to come there, and they translated our work. 
it was one restriction, though, uh, or at least, you know, not the restriction, but they asked that one of the poems that we, that we did be um, about something to do with maritime culture. And I'm from Chicago, okay, <laughs> the flat Midwest. You know, yes, we have a lake, but yeah, whatever, right? And so I have absolutely nothing, no understanding of maritime culture until I came here. Uh, so I went into a meditation to see if there was something I could, I could, could glean. And um, this is a poem that came out. And I was sent to represent the United States of America. So I'm happy to say we won the competition. <laughs> Touching the holes of salvaged slave ships for Mr. Robert Hayden. Oh, Lord, bless this ship. It sails its sacred voyage. Let its crew return safely from the water with sugar for our teas, gold for our coffers, and savages for the church to save. Amen. The Cora, the Adelaide, the Concord, the Triton, the Hope. The ship came like empty belly. The ship came like a fist in water. It sails white knives in the wind. It's keel like a cutlass on the wave. The ship was a hard hand chopping a chart through the ocean. The ship was a galley trailed by sharks waiting to grow fat with human. The ship was a cathedral of dysentery. The ship was a church of African bleeding. The ship danced the wine dark brine toward the scar of a new country. The wanderer, the Clotilde, the wildfire, the Friedensborg, the blessed. The ship came like a pit of moan, floating black flesh into fear and quiver, came with decks of rape-torn women tossed from lust to lust. While deep in its cramped bowels, a child spooned into the shape of prophet, writhed on a blanket of excrement, its legs shackled to another child, to another child, to another child, to another child, to another child rotting like strange fruit. The troubadour, the salamander, the tecora, the desire, the Jesus. Warning. When you touch the wrecked wood of a slave ship, the secret ear will open slowly. Open as some throat must have opened there in the dark miasma so wretchedness could rise into a song. If you listen, there is a voice in the wood. There is a cry trapped in the splintered hull. In the wreckage is the sound of black migration. It's ancestral memory fingering Robert Johnson's blue strings. To touch it is to know the ghost made of gospel that howled junkie sick through Charlie Parker's horn. It is to know that Nina Simone is the whip across the back and the medicine that hurts the flesh to healing. It is to become a slave ship, pitched and rolling on an ocean purpled by bloodstorm as the sickness in your belly rumbles from night to sunlight. To touch the hull of a slave ship is to understand the black need to dance the land's nude speech. It is to open the throat's portal and cry the cotton-filled holler, the sugar cane shout. It is to understand the need we have to spin skin to a Sunday morning prayer and ride on the decks of the blessed. Thank you. Um, um, I have a few moments now, so um, if I can find that poem, I will read that. But if I cannot, then I will read something else. Um, well, maybe I cannot. Maybe I am supposed to read this one. I am giving um, a performance with my band, Neon Juju. We call ourselves a, a literary arts on, ensemble, literary music ensemble. And we will be performing at the at Club Passim, April 20th. We'll be doing classic works reworked in new ways. And so come out and hear Achilles as a gangster rapper. You will hear portions of the Iliad rapped. You will hear, as you heard Shakespeare saying, you will hear uh, Doce et Decorum Est rocked out. You will hear Emily Dickinson on the blues. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, see me. Um, I'll end with this one. I think it's more appropriate. 
when they speak of our time, they will say, they will say this was a time when truth abandoned our words, when running sores passed for a false prophet's mouth, when television super shrinks conducted group psychosis, when drugged up teenagers lived in a haze of oblivion. They will say that this was a time we hamster willed inside of the jagged jaws of death that stood above us, hovering, licking its murderous lips. This was when blues and jazz meant nothing to the asterisk of adolescent faces lost in the footnote of pop cult hysteria. They will say that this was the hour of the falling towers when halos of metal rain screams on our cities and smoke blackened the skies until the sun became a jaundiced memory. They will say that this was a time when English spoken with the wrong accent meant an uncertain fate and both red and blue states forgot that God was colorblind. They will say that this was a time morality drank of Hollywood's hemlock as intellectual cowards bowed to the powers and promises of gold. They will say that a horrible darkness whispered our names until we closed our eyes, trembled with fear until we became the darkness we feared. They will say that this was a time of war in the name of terror, in the name of freedom, for the sake of peace, so there would be no more war in the name of. They will say that this was a time of shrunken bellies and refugees and of blood being plagued by the ache of disease and of islands floating away on rafts made of human bodies. They will say this was a time of the bullet bite, the misogynist lyric, and the anti-truth when we all danced to the beat of our children's cracking skulls. But let them also say this was a time we fought against a self-inflicted genocide, that something human in us stood up to resist the Orwellian jackboot, that finally in the rumbling throat of Ray Charles we heard what America could become and somewhere in the bite of Mark Twain's wit, we finally got the punchline, finally realized that manifest destiny would no longer patch the human-sized hole in our history. Let them say that it was when we said yes again and again and again and again to the pages of Pablo Neruda's verses resounding with peace for the coming twilight, peace for the bridge, peace for the wine, peace for the letters that seek us and rise in our blood entwining the old song of land and love, peace for the city when the morning, in the morning when the bread rises, peace for the ashes of our dead, peace for all living, peace for all waters and lands. Let them say that this was when the woman stepped forward to declare I am that I am and we men began to break ourselves of the need to break women. Let them say this was when we struggled against fist and fallacy and of lawyers abandoning courtrooms to plant wheat in Kenyan fields. That this was when truth found our mouths again and we were unafraid to speak it. Let them say that we were a people of faith in a time when faith was in crisis. That we were a people of hope when it made no sense to hope at all. That we still believed love could be as simple as the cliched images our ancestors painted on caves, images like birthing our first human songs of water and flower, the sun, moon, and star, wind and rain and river and fire, because even as the earth shook beneath our shoes, we knew there were things that would not change. Let them say that this was a time we desperately reached through the malignant maelstrom of electronic chaos and the maddening invocations of the soulless who profit from the poisonous pathology of our time. And we found others there with our own eyes and our own hands reaching back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Should I go? Do you want to do that Q&A stuff now? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I just didn't know. Everybody awake now? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Certainly. Reggie, Thank for you. your moving and shaking an important and powerful gift of words. Thank you. Um, and uh, what I had asked Reggie, if he'd stay for a few sure. more minutes and answer a few questions um, from you, if you have them. 
based do. on Reggie's poetry as well as his experience. And while you're thinking of that for a moment, sure. uh, Reggie, uh, because it's National Poetry Month, it is. Uh, we have had the tradition of honoring a poet as well as an activist uh, for our world oh. uh, this month. And in the past, I know uh, there was the time that uh, I gave uh, Doug Holder and B.G. Thurston, the, our uh, poets of that month, marathon towels and bottles of wa water and uh, la <laughs> laurel wreaths on their heads. Oh. Marathon stuff. Cool. I'm not going to do that to you today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but in addition to how you touch and reach us uh, as a poet through your words and your, your power of performance, as well as what you have done as an activist uh, in sharing your words out there and also in your teaching mm -hmm. and reaching out to others through your example of your work, through your workshops, through your hosting at different venues mm -hmm. also, and traveling across the world to reach people <coughs> through your words. Uh, I'd like to present you with this. Oh, yes. cool. It's not a this flower wreath. <laughs> this cool. is actually a little miniature sculpture from our town's very talented oh, cool. sculptor, Thank Michael you. Alfano. It is the questioning of the mind. Wow. Well, I, I wish you guys could see that. We will pass it around. town of Hopkinton. Thank you. So thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank One you. more hand for Reggie Gibson. Thank you. I... I love, I love, it's the questioning of the mind, you know? Um, I've often felt that poetry itself, every poem is really a question, right? And every, po every poem really, really starts off as a question, like, what if, or is this true? Or, you know, it's, it's, it's a way for me of, um, it's, it's, it's an excavating tool, you know, uh, to try to dig beneath, I guess, where it is that we are coming from and where we've been and what we're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank everyone who made that possible. Thank you. Next on the list, although not usual, but uh, I put myself on. And um, this is a poem I'd like to share today. Uh, and Reggie, I'm glad you're still here because uh, you were the source of inspiration for it, uh, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago. Um, myself not as a host, but as a, an attendee, a participant of one of your open mics. Um, I was inter uh, invited, as well as a number of other people from Club Passing, uh, to come on over to uh, Reggie's uh, open mic. He was hosting in Cambridge at the time, known as All Asia. Now, recently when I told Reggie about this, he referred to it as a more raucous open mic, and I guess he forgot to mention that to me back then. <laughs> so it was a different kind of an open mic for me, and as I arrived, I noticed uh, I felt different entering. Uh, uh, it was a room and of black men shouting, chanting, great poetry, and drumming. Uh, I've never been in a room with drumming and poetry before, and I have to say, I wasn't a drummer, I wasn't black, and I wasn't a man. <laughs> and I'm still not a man. Um, and I felt very different uh, being a quiet woman poet of the suburbs. But Reggie had invited and included me there, as he had so many other people, uh, for this as well as different events, as well as in his poetry. And that night, Steve Rapson was with me, too, and we got up. And I performed a quiet little poem, probably about my dog or something there. Um, and uh, it was just a wonderful experience and inspirational to me. And I felt it helped me grow as a poet and a performer and learn about inclusion and people uniting as one through poetry. And this is called, I have shared it a few times, and when someone helps me out uh, with a drum also, which I prefer. The day I took my skin off. It was one of those hot, still, middle of summer nights, and I was walking on the sidewalks of the city street, barely able to keep up with my own feet, because I was walking to an invitation where there was some mention of music, some mention of drums, some mention of poetry from a man I had met whose words, when spoken or sung, made my mouth drop open. And I was invited but unsure, unsure about something a little new, Unsure about something a little different, 
unsure if it was the right place for me to be since the one who had invited me was dramatic, loud like a preacher, emotional, articulate, black, and a man. Me being one who was quiet like a hushed nun, reticent, white, and a woman. But I decided to get in my car and go for a ride, drive to the city, walk to this place of invitation, step inside, poking my head in the door, hearing only loudness of words, motion, and beat, calling me to choose at that moment where I should be placing my feet. And I heard this loudness of singing of drums and a sax, and at that moment, I didn't know if it was me or it was them. I didn't know if it was black or it was white. I didn't know if it was man or it was woman. I didn't know if I should stay or I should go. And just then, he greeted me at the door, extended a friendly hand, slid a drum to my knees, told me to pound along with the sound, with a song. He told me like he was giving a prescription of something good for my soul, while at that moment I was wondering if I ever even had one. And suddenly I saw this sight before me, a circle of people playing with drums, singing the songs, this music softly moving me, quietly stirring me, tapping me on the shoulder, sliding my hands to the drum. And something snapped, and I let go of it all, melted into the sound of drums, into the songs of crowd, into the rhythm and beat, into millions of years falling backwards into the sounds of the first ones of whom we all come. Getting inside my head. Here's where the drum comes. <laughs> and I could see the flickers of gold and a purple rising up to the sky, crackling and sparkling, drawing us upward through the dance in our toes. And we're all there together, dancing to music, mouths moving in rhythm, our hands held in circle, eyes looking skyward, faces were glowing, feet simply knowing just how to respond. Hearts beating faster along with the drums making beautiful patterns, each one very different, but alike in the joy of our music and song. Thunder. Lightning, fire, sparks dancing outside us, upon the earth, into the sky, something so deep and surrounding. And I smiled, a smile of release, with this new feeling holding me, as I sat beside you, my brother, my sister, my earth, my sky. While we were playing our drums, singing our songs into the night. And I leaned back in my seat, no longer in my same skin. And I felt the peace. Thank you, Reggie. I came across something uh, that Charles Wright had uh, written in a poem called Thinking of Wallace Stevens at the Beginning of Spring. Um, there is so much that clings to us and wants to keep warm, familiar things, the blue sky. I like that beginning. Um, so I decided on the one poem that I, I did write, and I'll try to read it here, okay? Then and now at 72, I need songs. My father crooned like Sinatra. He'd telephone. Hi, doll. I knew all women were dolls. My mother, she was the doll. His bride with her 88-year-old doll-like dimple. She'd tell how it was with them before children her tales about bathtub gin, a tease that life, all mystery. But his songs, sentimental words, so 1930s, he played his guitar just for me. Well, I'm uh, way too serious, I think, but you have more chances to rejoice later after me, I mean. <laughs> Um, the first one is called Determination. <clears throat> the morning comes and I get up to make the daily inventory of my life. Past, present, and future blend to assess my worth in the light of the rising sun, in the middle of the spring, in the middle of the path between birth and death, or so I speculate. I must find faith to define myself. All the knowledge is based on high probability and hope. 
If the sun has risen for a million days in a row, it will perhaps rise tomorrow. From the cosmos and from the universe, I need to narrow down the picture to my world, the lawn in front, the birds, my room, his room, the two beds. There is no steady pattern, nothing is fixed, and it can, can be just as wrong as it is right. The truths are more like rules with too many exceptions. My scope is limited. Everything loses relevance outside of what I perceive. What exists is what affects me. What reminds me of death and of the fact that I'm alive only for a while? I'm an addict to anything that stimulates me. I'm not better because I don't kill. A sudden twist of luck, an unexpected turn of fate, I could be perhaps anything. The great composer of the next century, the guest attendant shot at the runaway, a child molester. I must still find an excuse to view myself fit and good. So this is the first one. I'll venture into another, just as gloomy. <laughs> <clears throat> live better is the title. The desire to live better prevails. What it might mean doesn't get settled. I read through the five steps for good sex. The strife to eliminate change comes at a cost that threatens my solvency. Why can't I understand what is mine and what is missing? Freedom and control, I'm afraid, are two sides of the same coin. I'm afraid anyway, but I try to forget it. Honor, dignity, pride, flagged as moral concepts, are maybe genetic defects, innate inability to be satisfied. The preordained, as I see it, changes depending on how fit I am to carry my cross. You know, the assigned fate. The cross is a trinket nowadays, and I put a lot of faith in sex to be cured. Yet, there is a claim the guy was really nailed. The one and only who can resolve what I am responsible for, at best sows doubts about what's done on his behest and what is my own muck, though I cannot shake off the need to know. I mull over where words like ego, soul, self, and I in search of a culprit, something else to unburden my failed purpose onto, but they seem to be wandering pilgrims, crisscrossing, not on their own will, the strange, inexplicable places of being. How many steps do I need to get there? This is a song called uh, Thanksgiving. Hope. 
hoping for the best, I mean result. Every place belongs to someone's grandson. Angry grandson. New world not for the grandson. And thus the pain, I mean result. My friend Bill Holzhauser, who is, to my sorrow, not around to read this anymore, um, in his wonderful, wonderful, you have to, I can't, I can't do his voice. If I even had a chance of being able to imitate his voice, I would try. Wonderful North Carolina voice that, that I'll be hearing in my head as I, as I read this. The pie safe. It was a new state. Arkansas, when the pie safe was built there, and it was the West, bordered by the Indian nation and a part of Texas, a part of Mexico called Texas. Secession and war were well in the future. He was a settler, settled enough at least that a heavy piece of furniture, awkward to move, was not a burden, but a possession worth working to build over the winter after harvest, to lever up his domestic economy and scotch it, to try to hold a bride and a cabin in place on these plains where all eyes looked westward, but the spring rains sucked it all east back toward the river. He had oak for the body and legs, thick cut and planed smooth. But the doors were red pine, rough cut so the round burns from backwood sawmill blade were branded in the surface. And the inner shelves were cypress dried to an olive corrugation, a bastard conglomerate of woods at hand. The iron nails were hand forged, square headed, widely spaced. He used nails too to peck constellations of hole patterns in tin, covered the round openings in each door to keep out flies, to keep out ants each leg absurdly small, tapered to fit in a jar lid his wife could fill with molasses. As he worked, he noted how his world assumed the shape of the pie safe. The day's square-shouldered, light-footed. Each night, a trunk of cypress shelved darkness, less vast than at other times. He thought, my work, not my name, will outlive me, will stand solid, useful, in unguessable days and places, and free its feet in another man's molasses after I'm gone. And the thought pleased him. The colander. 
Sky polka dots through the star patterned holes in the aluminum colander bowl. Bought a long time ago at Tags in Porter Square, back in college when we were steaming greens, straining peas, playing house until wilted in the afternoon, you pretend husband left. I kept that sieve through all five moves, the men, the chili, pasta al pesto, fishy soise. I bought that Florida cracker house in part for its property, lush palmetto jungle with wraparound creek, one after-party mission, shark's teeth. The closest tool at hand to sift the creek's mottled sand, the old aluminum colander bowl. We scattered, sifted, and found ancient pieces of fossilized jawbone. Frank next door said the creek had been polluted. Superfund. Frank, dead now. Cancer. The mustard brown scum, crusted to rough hewn aluminum, doesn't clean easy. Try as I may. Try, try. Spaghetti, next spaghetti, and the next. Why didn't I pitch what I couldn't scrub clean? Ten years later, the crud doesn't show anymore, except maybe on internal x-ray. I look at that colander and see cancer, Alzheimer's, one or another of those men dancing with me in the kitchen. I have a poem about Spider Woman, and Cheryl asked why we chose the poem. I didn't really think about it, but um, growing up, my name was Kathy Weaver, and I always collected um, poems and stories about weaving. My mom had eight kids, so the spider motif came in really early, and Spider Woman has been a very constant in my life from way back, and it's truly one of my favorite poems, and poetry for me has truly been a lifesaver. Spider Woman is a force, the magnetic source of all our world. Spinning, twirling, mighty thread to create the double illusion of time and space, the two threads that run our heads. We're told that in days of old, Spider Woman leaned down and helped out, weaving reeds into baskets, weaving string into nets, and weaving thread into fabric. Most importantly, she helped with weaving stories into the fabric of life, and the stories were the matrix each culture lived by. But then we put Spider Woman aside. No one spoke of her anymore. In the industrial age, the modern era, silly stories about a spider had to go. Put aside into the back of a dusty, musty old closet, Spider Woman sat and sat and sat and sat and waited and then slowly began to weave a new web. Magically, she emerges in splendid shape, stronger and totally transformed, present and hidden at the same time, right in front of our own eyes, right in time for the information age. Her web emerges as the vital link for the present time. She has been quietly weaving the source of information, links for this age, weaving the web known today as the internet. Spider Woman smiles knowingly from her hidden closet. The stories told within this web are finally reuniting the entire globe through new communication, creating new community. Spider Woman is a force, the magnetic source of all our world. Honor the spider, honor the web. Interconnections, the vital thread, honor the ties that bind us to earth. Spider Woman is present to guide our rebirth. And this is um, one of my songs called The Best of My Heart. You could look at me through a stained glass window, see my opaque colors glistening from afar. You could watch the sun shine in all its glory, hold out all its promise till the sky is dark. You could talk to me, tell me everything sacred. I protect all your dreams here and keep them safe. Confide in me, tell me
me all of your problems I'll help you find answers Get you back on your way Get you back on your Just for not necessarily my favorite, maybe it's my favorite because I consider myself a very lucky person. I came to United States with five dollars and no English as an adult. Of course, I had a place to stay. So it's called Looking Within. I will read some part of it and the end of it. Maybe I will change the tune into the music if I can. I moved from far away across the Pacific Ocean to this golden land of opportunity. Ups and downs struggled through many, many obstacles, stumbled into the very things I ran away. Afraid of being starving artist, I walked safe and practical paths. Golden land was joyless, lonely place without art, even if it brought physical comfort and beautified environment. Paradise, not a paradise, if you are not in peace in yourself. Peace is not from external surrounding. Peace is looking within, being true to yourself. True to your color. Thank you. I've been doing a lot of reading lately about bears. And in my reading, both the natural history and um, stories, myths. And in my reading, I came across a wonderful word, crespuscular, 
which means, if you don't know, I didn't know, um, active at twilight. And since having a dog, I've become rather crespuscular myself. On the literal cusp, on the brim, on the rim, on the break of the bowl, on the bowl of the day, birds climbing to star-filling skies, clouds shadowing purple undersides, the lining of smoking jackets and gowns, bare paws setting out from the den, set into strawberry, goldenrod, loam. Pre-dawn, alarm, fish and fisher, legs scissor, slide to the edge, walking but not waking, water splashed on the face, under arms, long underwear, turtleneck, earmuffs, scarf, gloves, hood, boot, becoming the grizzly before the light, walking, waking, only those with animals and tethers out, and the cars, headlights sharking through mists heavy enough to heal our flight. Um, and this next one, um, based on a, a Haida myth, the title is Kimon Kamui Sankiri, and in the Haida language, that means descendants of the bear. And the Haida are a Pacific Northwest Coast people, and they have a very strong relationship with the bear. Every culture has its origin in seduction or a rape. He said, she said, but often he. In this version, the great creature comes to the door in silence, stirring the young girl's or the widow's hunger. Who could blame her desire, with or without divine prophecy, to bury the shadow loneliness or inspiration in a stranger's curling limbs? In this version, the bear does not force the hide a girl what is of greatest interest is what is not in the story. When I am barren and alone, will you in your fur robe come looking for me? This poem is really for my daughter, my daughter of three horses, three dogs, one cat, and much chemo. Before darkness, the other sounds begin, down beyond the winding slope, an S-curved, gritty road edged with speckled stones. I avoid crimson weeds within the drag of brambles, snakes, thorns, and crumbled leaves. I know my daughter's nosy dog is secure inside her house. No need for me to enter unfamiliar woods to call the young dog home. I'm free to watch wandering shadows, dragged from maples, oaks, pines, creep between trunks, then branches, listen to an owl duet in wonder. From the lower field, I hear voices, coyotes in pursuit of night. One, perhaps the leader, has higher, sharper pitch three yelps, then prolonged howl, repeat. Thank you. I'd like to share a song I wrote called Celebrate, so that no matter how things get in life, we have to remember to celebrate the moment. And I'm an interactive singer, so I would love it once you catch on to the chorus to sing with me. It's a good life, so live it. Live it to the fullest. It's a good life. Live it every day. Every minute, every hour, every second, every flower. It's a good life. Live it every day. It's a good life, so live it. Live it every minute, every minute, every single day. Every minute, every hour, every second, every flower. It's a good life. Live it every day. See the birds and the butterflies, all people through loving eyes. Thank your lucky stars above every day. Share your joys and your sorrows. Don't fret about tomorrow's. And remember, 
give yourself some love. Yes, remember, give yourself that love. Cause it's a good life, so live it. Live it to the fullest. It's a good life. Live it every day. Every minute, every hour, every second, every flower. It's a good life. Live it every day. And remember to sing your sound. There is no right or wrong. Don't matter if you sing out a tune. Free your voice. Let it rise. Feels good, you'd be surprised. Can you sing your heart song soon? How about with Lala's? La 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 It's a good life, so live it every second, miraculous kind of day. It's a good, good life. Remember that. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and far more temperate. Rough winds do come and shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Wed am, wed am, zay. Shimmed whip and wowed and did out of a way. Shed a nest at a shooting way. Sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often his gold complexion dims. And every fair from fair sometimes, sometimes declines By chance or nature's changing course untrimmed But thy eternal summer shall not fade nor shall you lose possession of that beauty which thou owest. Nor shall death brag your wondrous in its shade. When in eternal times through these lines you grow, you grow, you grow. For as long as men can breathe, as long as eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee.